world, this is CS50 Live, and boy, do we have an amazing episode for you today. First, an inside look at how Dropbox works, then a close look at tiny hamsters eating tiny burritos, and lastly, a behind-the-scenes look at CS50's new film, Persistence. But first, Dropbox.com, where we recently traveled in San Francisco, California, to meet with CS50's own former head teaching fellow, Thomas Carriero, who gave us a tour of Dropbox and exactly what it's like to work and, dare say, live there. Now, we sat down not only with Thomas while there, but also with CS50's former head teaching fellow, Alex Elaine, to talk about the underlying workings of Dropbox.com and its distributed architecture. Let's take a look. I'm Thomas Carriero. I'm a software engineer at Dropbox. I'm Alex Elaine. Uh, I'm an engineer here at uh, Dropbox. Yeah, so I was actually uh, the first head TF for CS50 when David Malin took over the class. Um, I had already been teaching CS50 for two semesters uh, with Mike Smith, who was the, the prior professor, professor there. Uh, so I actually I didn't take CS50, but I did TF it twice, once as a, once as a regular TF. And then uh, my senior year, I was actually head TF. Uh, of CS50, uh, which was a lot of fun. So when David reached out to me about uh, kind of setting up Dropbox in the, uh, in the CS50 appliance, I was really excited because we actually have a Linux client. So uh, most of our users use either Windows or the Macintosh clients, um, but the Linux, Macintosh, and Windows clients are all actually very similar. So what we did is we pre-installed the uh, Dropbox Linux client in the CS50 appliance, and it runs just like all of our other uh, Linux users. So the way Dropbox works is it runs as a client on many different uh, operating systems and devices. The Dropbox desktop client is one of the most well-known and one of the most interesting. So Dropbox basically uh, takes all of the files that you put in the folder and it chunks those files into four megabyte chunks. So uh, we'll take you know, a 100 megabyte PDF file and we'll chunk it into 25 four megabyte chunks. Those chunks are then encrypted, and then we send them to our, uh, our block servers. The block servers are the storage for, uh, for the blocks themselves. And so each block is stored in the block server with the, the data and a, a SHA-256 hash of that, uh, of that block. That's a very basic encryption primitive that uh, summarizes, in some sense, the data in a, in a very uh, unique way that's unique to that data. You could upload the whole file all at once, but it turns out if you, if you do that, uh, really large files, they take a really long time to upload. And if you have a failure, you're out of luck and you have to restart it. What we then do is we tell another server in our system, what we call the meta server, the metadata server, uh, hey, this is a file and it's composed of the following list of blocks. And we pass up the hashes to identify those blocks rather than re-uploading the whole block. The meta server then checks with the block server, makes sure the blocks are there. If they are, perfect, everything is good. When we want to basically you know, download the file from the internet, let's say, um, we'll, say we'll ask meta server first, hey, can you tell me about where this file is located? And meta server will say, oh, well, this file is actually 25 four megabyte chunks, and here they are. And then we'll go to block server and we'll actually download each of those chunks. And then we'll reconstruct the file from there, and then we'll start the download. Yeah, so Dropbox deals with scale um, basically by very, very aggressive sharding. So sharding is when you take all of the, the users in your, uh, your startup or your company, and they, maybe they used to be on one database. And that works great until you hit a certain number of users. And really what you want to do is find some way to split those across two databases, or maybe more than two, ideally enough that you can have every user in the world. And so when you shard, what you do is you find some way of deciding uh, which a database to go to and that doesn't require hitting a central directory. Or maybe it's a very quick, cheap lookup in that central directory. We never, uh, we never have everything stored in one database because that's almost never going to scale. So instead, what we do is we'll, we'll take all of that information, all of the files or all of the metadata, and we'll shard it across hundreds or thousands of logical databases. And that means that when we have a, uh, a request for a user's information, we'll first say, hey, which database is this user's information stored in? And then we'll basically use that uh, decision to go find that database, and that's where we'll load kind of all of the files or all of the metadata about the files. So we use a lot of sharding, um, but sharding is not always enough. You actually need to cache a lot of the common requests because even those database queries can be expensive. Um, so we also do kind of aggressive caching strategies to make sure that the most common requests are quite easy to compute and basically uh, that makes it a lot faster and, and it makes it work at scale. So that's at a very high level kind of how Dropbox works. Uh, my name is Alex Elaine. 
I'm Thomas Carriero, and this is CS50. Now, if you've ever wondered where this quote on CS50's website come from, it's actually Alex, who was the original author. Now, speaking of Dropbox, I recently received this email from them in my inbox. Hi, David. You may notice that some of your shared links aren't working, and we wanted to reach out to you personally to let you know why. Well, what's a shared link? Well, if you've used Dropbox beyond simply saving your source code inside of the appliance, you might know that you can create shared links by typically right-clicking on a file and copying a URL to your clipboard. That shared link might look a little something like this, but instead of the word secret, there's actually something more cryptic there, like a sequence of random letters and numbers. The idea being that I could now email or gchat this kind of URL to a friend, and he or she could access cs50.txt and download it onto his or her computer. And only by knowing that URL, or with super, super low probability guessing that URL, could someone else actually access the file. Unfortunately, a company known as Intralinks recently posted on their Collaborista blog that there's actually a couple of threats to this particular workflow. It turns out that if you accidentally make a mistake, as I frankly have done in the past, and paste a URL like a Dropbox shared link into not your browser's address bar, but as pictured here, your search bar, that URL, of course, is going to be submitted to a search engine like Google. Of course, Google's not going to necessarily recognize that shared link, and so you're going to get more generic search results like a link to Dropbox.com itself and in this case an advertisement, and in fact advertisements potentially for competitors of Dropbox. In fact, that's how Intralinks noticed this. They too were running an AdLinks cam AdSense campaign alongside of keywords that Dropbox themselves might use. And so if we zoom in on the bottom result here, you'll see that Intralinks has this link to their own service. Now, one of the features of Google and other search engines advertising campaigns is that when a user like me clicks on this link now, I am going to be disclosing the URL that I typed into Google in order to find these search results. The idea being that companies would like to know how people are finding their website. Of course, if I found this page of results by pasting an otherwise secret URL into Google, I've now effectively told Intralinks and their web logs exactly what secret URL I was visiting, thereby disclosing potentially the contents of cs50.txt. Now, there's another thread altogether. You may know, too, from Dropbox shared links that you can typically open them inside of your own browser and preview them inside of a frame like this. But if that preview contains a hyperlink, as pictured here, to example.com, and you or a user click that hyperlink, thereby opening a new tab or window with that page's URL, what you've also just told the web server by nature of how HTTP works is the HTTP refer address from whence you came. In other words, you inform the destination website that you were previously at this supposedly secret URL. Now, what Intralinks discovered by looking through their own logs is that they found quite a bit of information that was surely meant to be secret. For instance, someone's mortgage application, someone's tax return, and bunches of more documents as well. Now, if you'd like to learn more about this particular threat, head to Dropbox's blog at this URL here. And the reality is that you can't really defend against the threat in which people like me accidentally paste what should be secret URLs into search engines. You and I are simply going to have to be a bit more careful, but they have been working on redressing the other issue whereby links that are embedded in a Dropbox preview were disclosing the refer URL. But head to that URL for more details. But now, as promised, a closer look at tiny hamsters eating tiny burritos.
Now, CS50's team recently had an opportunity to participate in a 48-hour film project, an international competition during which teams have, indeed, 48 hours alone to make a film. The catch is that you only find out what film you need to make at the very start of those 48 hours. In particular, on a recent Friday evening at 7 p.m., we, CS50, learned that we'd be making, one, a silent film, two, that the film needed to feature a character named Jeremiah Jones, a teacher, three, that the film needed to feature a diary, this one here, and four, that we needed to somehow include the line, it is what it is, even though, of course, we were making a silent film. Now, 26 members of CS50's team participated in this 48-hour film project, among them Colton, Dan, Patrick, and Shelley Westover, whom you may recall from such films as this one here. Now, also involved, of course, was CS50's own Ramon Galvan. Ramon, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And CS50's own Davin Farnham. Now, Ramon, what was your role in the film? So I co-directed with Dan, actually. And Davin, yourself? I was the star, so I was basically, I basically made the project. I saved the film. You basically. saved the film. I did. Now Under you say direction. this, <laughs> but I believe we have your screen test for this film. If we could oh, roll no. this clip here. <laughs> My name's Davin Farnham. This is CS, CS50. I wanted to say CSS. <laughs> this is CSS. <laughs> now this was your first film? Uh, no, maybe. No. <laughs> well, at least, at least this time around, it was a, a silent film. Yes. So at 7 p.m., we found out those required ingredients, and then we immediately dived in as a group to figure out what movie we were actually going to make. Do you want to walk us through what that night was like? So basically, so we got the idea, and at 7 o'clock, we basically started to brainstorm. So we all kind of gathered around a whiteboard and started brainstorming ideas. And then by 9 o'clock, we tried to throw it off to writers, and the writers took it from there. And meanwhile, Dan and Shelly and I actually headed to Target, of course, our favorite nearby store, to pick up all of the props for the movie we had decided on, which at that point was... We had decided on a parody adventure film. <laughs> which was going to be quite like Indiana Jones. Yes, so we needed a bullwhip and we needed a fedora and stuff. And a, a very ornate piece of jewelry that he would then find at yes. the end of the episode. <laughs> of course, we get back at like midnight or so from Target and realize, nope, that's not the movie we're making. Psych. Completely different film. We had, like a, we had a film noir <laughs> for a couple of hours, then we had romantic comedy at the end. So by 4 a.m. we had romantic comedy, and around 5 a.m. you and Dan, the other director, yeah, showed so, up. Yeah, so we got together and uh, we kind of planned out where we would shoot, uh, what scenes we would shoot first, and then around 7 or 8 a.m. we actually went out and started shooting. Well, if you can stick around, we'd love to do some behind-the-scenes looks at how the film was made, but I think first, shall we give folks the world premiere of CS50's film, Persistence.
Guys, I, just... I mean, so let's start from the top. So the very first scene we all shot as a group that morning took place around 8 a.m. And we were actually here in Jefferson Hall, which is actually one of the phys physics lecture halls on campus. And what was the goal with this scene? So we're here to set up the movie. Davin as the, uh, a teacher or a teaching fellow or a teaching assistant, something like that. And he's really upset that he sees this couple walking out and he wants that. He wants to be in a, in a relationship, he just doesn't have it. And then the next scene we transitioned to actually wasn't shot in order. In fact, here you are... So here, actually, we shot this. This is one of the last scenes we shot. But this actually shows up at the very beginning of the film. And so in this scene, it's a montage. And so what I'm doing is I'm putting on cologne, I'm combing my hair. Who's cologne? I don't know, Ramon's cologne. <laughs> Uh, lots of cologne. And whose shirt? Uh, Ramon's shirt. So in fact, you, that was more than one take, and the shirt by the end was pretty... Yes, I think we had to take three or four takes, so each take was three squirts, so <laughs> there was tw about 12 squirts of cologne, so I smell like that cologne for the rest of the day. All right, well, at least very quickly, we transitioned outside, and in fact, if you look closely, this is actually CS50 zone Lauren Carvalho, but what were you thinking with this scene? Right, so in this scene, we're trying to get her attention, so I'm walking by her, I'm peacocking, of course. Peacocking? Oh. You don't know. Uh, just, Should I? Okay. Yeah, of course, of course. It, okay. So peacocking. So normal walking, of course, is just just normal walking. So this is normal walking. That's normal walking. Peacocking. <laughs> throw a little hips in there. It's really all right here. It's all it's right here. It's from this quote. Right here. This it's all right, right here. There. It's on the hips. And then at the very end, you have to <laughs> pop and lock. Of course, it's key to the lock. maneuver. It's key. Pop and lock. All right, well, you, you actually did a lot of physical comedy in the film. In fact, one of the next scenes was here at Lamont Library outside the door. Yes, so right here, so I'm actually trying to, I think it's a pull door, and I'm pushing, and as the scene progresses, I'm pushing and pushing ever more aggressively. And I think at the end, someone actually knocks me out of the way. Yeah, and in fact, yeah. we didn't notice this yeah, I, I, until the editing yeah, phase, so but. If we zoom into this shot, uh, and Dan, can we enhance a little bit? OK, perfect. <laughs> so you can actually see me crouch down about to pop up and knock Davin in the face with the door. Which, that was yes, fun yeah. found footage, right? Just hours before we had to shift the film <laughs> exactly. to the deadline. All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining and for starring in such oh, 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 thank you. a moving thank film. You. I mean. Well, that is it for CS50 Live. Thanks so much to our friends at Dropbox. Thanks so much to everyone behind the camera, CS50 Zone, Ramon Galvan and Davin Farnham. This was CS50, and this was our favorite scene that didn't make it into the film. I'm gonna get the car in your coming. That's okay.